Okay. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh, wow. How are you guys doing tonight? Okay, fantastic. That was nice of you guys to clap for me like that. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, well, tonight we're, we're honored to have uh, Kansas City Chiefs kicker Harrison Budker. So tonight. If you follow him, you'll know that uh, uh, we're pre excited about having butt kicker number seven here. So that's, Harrison grew up in the Atlanta area at West, and at Westminster High School. He played football, soccer. He's a three-time All-State champion in basketball and uh, really didn't take up uh, kicking the football until about his sophomore year, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and one of my favorite Harrison Butker fun facts for his four years in high school, he was the first chair tuba player for the school symphonic band. So he's a well-rounded guy. Uh, we got some Raven Regiment guys out there, right? Uh, Butker played at Georgia Tech and is the all-time leading scorer in school history. He's captain of the team his senior year. While at Georgia Tech, Harrison majored in industrial engineering. Uh, Georgia Tech is the number one industrial engineering program in the world. He was drafted by the Carolina Panthers, but did not make the team as they settled for a veteran, but was signed by the Chiefs almost immediately in September of that year and has been their kicker ever since. He's second in NFL uh, history and career field goal percentage with 90.1% of field goals made. During his career, Harrison has been picked as a special teams player of the week numerous times and has had several game-winning field goals, including the amazingly clutch 49-yard game-tying field goal against the Buffalo Bills to force overtime in the divisional game last year. So his athletic success is amazing, but what we're what here at Benedictine College know is that there's more to the man than football. Harrison has not only has not been shy about his three priorities, faith, family, and football in that order. He's married to Isabel, his high school sweetheart, and they have two children, James and Bernadette. A strong Catholic, Harrison has said on more than one occasion that his ultimate goal is not the Super Bowl, but rather to get his family to heaven. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. And so is the character of the man that has made us so excited to have Harrison Butker here tonight. So let's welcome Harrison Butker. Thank you. Thank you. Harrison, thanks so much for uh, visiting Benedictine College. I, I want to explore tonight your uh, commitment to faith, family, and football uh, for our students. You've made no secret of your commitment to the faith, and specifically the Catholic faith, but it wasn't always that way, right? Uh, since you are talking to a group of college students, could you take us through your faith journey, uh, where you were and where you are now? Yeah, so I, I grew up Catholic. I uh, went to a Catholic elementary school in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, the, the faith was important for us growing up. You know, we went to Mass every, every Sunday. My, both sets of grandparents were Catholic. But I think as I got more involved with sports, especially year-round soccer, when we traveled on the weekends, if it was inconvenient, we just didn't go to Mass on Sunday. So I think from an early age, maybe, I grew up thinking that, well, if it's inconvenient, maybe the faith uh, can go on the back burner. So going off to college, that was my time to finally get away from the parents, I was able to just kind of live the football life, the college life that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, and I didn't want the sacraments or mass on Sundays to be a part of that. For me, it was, it was inconvenient. I was studying industrial engineering, playing football, trying to be the best I could be. It wasn't until my second year um, on the team when Grant Asin, a walk-on punter, joined, and, you know, I'm starting scholarship kicker, I want to, you know, play in the NFL, I have all these great aspirations, and then we have this walk-on kicker that is just, he's very chatty, he's getting in everyone's business, but there's something different about him. Yeah. You know, he was on fire for the faith, and when I found out he was Catholic, I did not want to tell him, because I knew he was going to latch on to me and try to get me to, uh, <laughs> to get back in the pews, but through whatever way, he found out I was Catholic, and I reluctantly went to the Catholic Center um, just to give it a shot because again, you know, th there's a lot of highs in college, right? The, the college life is very fun, but there's a lot of lows. You know, you're, you're on your own for the first time. You're trying to figure out who you are. 
maybe you're trying to fit in with a certain crowd and you're struggling, you're looking for answers, you might be struggling with school and all the stress that that brings. But I was able to go to the Catholic Center, give it a shot with this guy, Grant, and from there, I just slowly had this intellectual conversion, I'd say. Uh, you know, you grow up and you hear all these things that the Catholic Church believes, and you're saying, why, why does this, this old church believe all of these things? They need to get with the, the times, and mm-hmm. this, isn't, this isn't cool, you know, it's kind of lame. Why do they believe all these things? We had a great priest that was unapologetically Catholic. His, his homilies were amazing, and I was able to learn so much about the faith. And even from there, I started to meet with him individually and just asking him all these questions. So I had this intellectual conversion. I, I knew that you know, there was only one faith that Jesus Christ established, and that was the, the Catholic faith. And I had to finally have this conversion in my heart. I had to change my ways, the ways I was living. So I sat down, had this big, long examination of conscience, and, you know, prayed to have sorrow for my past life, past sins, and basically accepted that all these things on this sheet were, were sins. And I went to confession, and it was an amazing moment for me to finally uh, to be in a state of grace and kind of begin that journey of walking with Christ and, and following his commandments for, for how we should love him and how we should love others. And that was very impactful for me. And then from there, I, I just slowly started to to grow in prayer, uh, grow in going to the, the sacraments. And, you know, that one little small relationship that I initially had with Grant has blossomed into uh, him being uh, the best man in my wedding. And he's mm. brought so much fruit for uh, me and my wife and my children, as I'm sure we'll, we'll get to a little bit later. But um, very impactful, just that, that small relationship and him going out of, of, of himself to reach out to, to those around him. And uh, through the grace of God, I'm, I'm here today as a, as a practicing Catholic. Yeah, that's an amazing story. I, I think it's really important for uh, the students to know that Grant was just, you were really drawn to him by his joy. Tell us the first time you met him story, which I thought was really interesting. You were going out on the field to kind of get your work in, right? And here's this walk-on punter trying to take up your time, right, on the field. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It's been a while, but, you know, I think I was training, yeah, in the off season to my sophomore season. You know, I'm very focused. I just want to go and get my work in, and there's this Guy Grant shows up and he's got his shirt off and he's just like getting all up in my business and just annoyed me so much. <laughs> that this guy is trying to, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he's trying to hold some balls or just trying to talk to me, whatever, whatever it was. But it was just, it was very annoying for me. But I had to get over myself. I had a, I had a lot of pride. I, I still do. We all have pride and we should, uh, we do humility um, like our Lord and Savior Jesus and be like a lamb. But I just had so much pride. You know, and I just did not want to be bothered by anyone, especially this this walk on. I'm so much better. I'm a scholarship guy. And he was, he was just uh, shirt off all up in my business. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think he even asked yeah, you to tape him, right? Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, will you tape me so yeah, I can yeah. learn how yeah, to be exactly. better? Exactly. So I'm, I'm going to stop kicking. I'm going to stop practicing so I can film you in the hopes that you can have a good tryout and hopefully make the team <laughs> one day. Yeah. So that's great. Um, so tell, tell me, you haven't been shy about this. Tell me why it's important to tell your story and, and be upfront about your faith journey. It's very important. You know, this is a, a great Catholic school where y'all are learning how to be leaders in a, a world that doesn't necessarily want to hear Christian opinions. So we have to be leaders, and in, in what does that look like? You know, we. We, you might be a professional athlete one day. You might be working a nine-to-five desk job. You might be an entrepreneur. You might be a teacher. God could put you wherever. You might be raising your family just as a, as a mother, as a, you know, homeschooling your kids. Whatever that looks like, you know, God's calling you to be a leader and to evangelize in whatever that vocation is. For whatever reason in our society, because I kick a, a weird-shaped ball through two yellow uprights, people care what I have to say. And I, I, I pray for God's will to be done in, in my life. And I, I really firmly believe that I can practice as hard as I want if I go out there, that 49-yarder against the Bills, and God doesn't want that ball to go through the uprights, it's not going to happen. Now, I, I have to train and practice to make it go through the uprights. It might be his will for me to make that kick, but if I don't put in the work, it's not happening. But I believe no matter how much work I can put in, if he doesn't want me to make that kick and I'm praying for his will to be done in my life, he's not going to allow it. And I have to be okay with that, and I won't be on this stage. You won't be cheering for me. You won't care who I am. But because that ball is going through, I do have a platform, and I need to do good with it. 
and uh, like I was saying, we need, we need to have leaders in our world that, that push the faith, that push the virtues, um, that push Jesus Christ to be our model for what it means to be uh, a human being and, and what it means to have a, a strong relationship with God our Father. So I'm doing my best with, with that platform, but just because I'm a professional athlete doesn't mean that I have any special talents to go out and evangelize compared to someone that, that might not have the reach that I do. Grant Asin was able to bring me back, and through that I'm, I'm now here talking to you and talking at other events. So just one small action uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in people can, can have massive rippling effects. Mm -hmm. Here at Benedictine, we have a devotion to Our Lady, and we've actually consecrated the college to the Blessed Virgin Mary. You also have a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and, and devotion to the Rosary. Can you ex talk about that? Yeah, mother, mothers are so important. You know, like we have our father, you know, he's, he's normally the, the leader of the household. He's going out, he's making money, hopefully, for, for the family, for us to be able to go to college, high school. But, you know, the, the mother is the one that nurtures us from a very young age that we can, can hopefully always turn to, to be comforted and uh, for her to provide for us. So I was Im immediately intrigued by who the Blessed Mother is, um, you know, if there's any Protestants in here, that, that might be a hang-up of, of the Blessed Mother and, and why do we give her so much esteem? Well, we, we could never love her more than Jesus loved her, right? Like, we, we all probably have a really close relationship with our own mother. Jesus loves all of us, but he's probably going to love his own mother a little bit more than, than any of us um, can even love our own mother or even potentially than Jesus can, can love us. I know his love is infinite, but I just want you to understand that bond is so special between him and his mother. And the Blessed Mother is in heaven right now with Jesus. She's very close to him, and, and we can come and we can pray to her to, to talk with him and to, to have her intercede for us just as we would have a special friend pray for us if we were in need. We can go to the Blessed Mother and ask her to pray. So the rosary, it was this thing that in Catholic elementary school, we probably prayed once a month, and you know we had people come up and explain each decade of the rosary and probably read a passage, so it probably took an hour, and I just thought that's how long a rosary took. It was an hour long, and <laughs> yeah. through talking with Grant, you know, he was like, yeah, I pray the rosary. I go, okay, what do you pray, like once a week? He's like, no, I pray it every day, and that was the first time in college that I heard, well, first time in my life was in college that I heard that people pray the rosary every day, so I started doing that, and you know, in our society, people talk so much about meditation. And I know how important meditation is because I've prayed the rosary so much and I see all the benefits that that's provided for me. It was instrumental for me to continue to grow in the, in the faith in college. Um, it was instrumental for my wife in her conversion to the faith. And people ask me, you know, when I'm on the field, am I just locked in on the game? What's going on? Well, I found I actually do better, you know, at least when the defense is out there to just kind of step away. And a lot of times I am praying a rosary or trying to get my mind off the game. I mean, it's a three and a half hour game. I can't be locked in the entire time, but as soon as 15 gets the ball, then I'm going to my net and I'm starting to warm up. Yeah. But I, I can't say enough about the rosary and, and how great um, that has been for, for my life and for so many people that, that um, I look up to as, as mentors for, for leading me. Well, I appreciate that, and specifically for men as well, that uh, men should be devoted to the rosary as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah and we need the masculine and the feminine, and it's, it's easy for men to look to other men as mentors. I definitely do that, but there is something very special about a strong feminine mother that we can always turn to. Right, good. You also understand you have a love for blessed Per, Ger per Giorgio, Giorgio Frasati, yes, yes. right? And adopted his same verso lato uh, to the heights. Yes, so tell yes. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, Blessed Pier Giorgio, he was a, a young gentleman in Italy that was doing a lot of uh, various charitable works. In his meantime, you never know it, he was very social, um, very much in the world as we all should be. We should be in the world and then evangelize the world, but very much in it, happy guy. But he was also doing all these these other works that were uh, very charitable and uh, very meritorious for heaven. And um, he had a very beautiful life. He died young, um, but he was an outdoors guy. He was a young, strong man. And um, 
but, but he used his platform for, for good and he didn't boast about it. He didn't have a lot of pride about it. And um, he's been someone that I've uh, looked up to and I've adapted this mantra that he, he said once. There was a photo of him taking, climbing a mountain and he just signed it to the heights and that's kind of um, been connected to him. But when I say to the heights, the most, um, I don't know, obvious, well, I don't know. You might uh, have different ideas for what that means. But when I think of to the heights, I think of number one, getting to heaven. You know, that's, that's why we're all here, is to grow in our relationship with Christ and to, to get in heaven, right? Number two is, I, I want to kick the ball high. I want to kick the ball far, so to the heights. But uh, number three, I think this is maybe the part that a lot of people miss, is that we should try to be great and virtuous in everything we do. You know, the virtue of magnanimity, of, of being great. You know, often I think that as, as Catholics, we should just go pray all day in the chapel and for some people, you should, right? Like if you're a, a monk or a, a nun, and um, we all have to have a very strong prayer life, you know, to, to push us forward, especially if you're, a, you know, a father, father, husband, you can pray for your wife and your kids. That is definitely important, but I always have that temptation to just pray, and then I'm just going to read on my own, and just stay in the house and not ever leave. But we're called to do great things. We're called to be leaders. And that was kind of what I was talking about um, earlier. So to the heights is, is being great in this world, evangelizing this world, and you know, um, growing in the virtue of magnanimity to do great things for Jesus, for Christ. All the apostles, I mean, can you imagine Pentecost comes and you can, magi- not magically, but through the grace of God, you can speak all of these language and you're going up to foreign lands to evangelize. I'm sure there's many apostles that were like me and maybe some, some of you all that just wanted to, to stay in the house and you know, just stay with your community, but we need that strong community. We need our prayer. We need our foundation, but then we have to go out from there. Um, obviously, the, the first thing, that foundation is most important. We don't ever want to lose that because you do see that a lot with people that, that they go out, they're, they're trying to be a leader, they're trying to, to go out and to evangelize, but if you're, you're, if you're too far from that tree, then that's when the branch just falls off and you're, you're all alone. So you definitely need that community first. But I just urge you all to go be leaders in the world and uh, continue to, to fight for the kingdom and Christ is king. That reminds me, uh, we have a, uh, a great story from our engineering department. You were an industrial engineering major and one of our engineers came to a head of the engineering department and said, what can I do to become a better engineer? I want to be, become a better engineer. And so he said, well, the first thing you should do is go to adoration one hour a week, right? And then come right, back right. and talk to me, right? So, so that's kind of neat, right? So yeah. yeah um, to the heights. We all have different talents. And if you're not in adoration and you're not praying about it, you might be following the wrong talent for your life. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure that's a big temptation for people. If your parents are telling you you need to be X, Y, or Z, that might not be what God wants you to be. And what a shame that would be to be following a path that wasn't God's will for your life. So it definitely has to be yeah. based on prayer. And, you know, like I was talking about earlier, if, if it's not God's will, I don't want it to be done. Mm-hmm. Right. So if he, if he wants me to miss the field goal, I, I hope I miss the field goal and <laughs> I can go down a different path that God wants me to go down. So you're in a pretty secular business. You're an NFL player. Uh, you actually, your work day is actually Sunday, yes, right? Okay. So, uh, yes. uh, so how do you share your faith in your work? And is there a Catholic, uh, well, Christian community there in the NFL? And, and how do you get your how do you get your mass in? Well, yeah, it's tough. You know, you're you're performing on Sunday for hundreds of thousands of people. A lot of people on TV and for you, I mean, you're almost, you're almost the, the priest up on the altar at Arrowhead Stadium. That's their church. Mm-hmm. And how unfortunate is that that a lot of people are not prioritizing rest and church and family time over football? Now, I think you can do both. Right. You know, I think you definitely can do both. But, but so many people, unfortunately, prioritize football. And, and that's the one thing I hate about it, I guess, that, uh-huh. that sometimes I do feel like I'm because of the em- en- entertainment that I provide is taking people away from uh, maybe honoring the Sabbath as, as well as we should. But um, I am in a secular business. You know, you, you have to have that strong community and it's sometimes hard to find. But, but if you don't have it there, you gotta have it away from the facilities. And I feel like I've, I've, I've had to grow in, you know, the, the friends that I have from church, people like Grant, um, that, that are close, that hold me accountable, and then from there I can go out to the facilities and, 
and evangelize to the, to the best of my ability. You know, there are some Catholics on the team. Tommy Townsend, the punter, is a Catholic. Some, some coaches are. But it's not as many people as you would think. And growing up, I had a lot of role models. You know, I grew up a Falcons fan. And you see a lot of these top athletes that they say the right things in the interviews. And you think, wow, that is a great person to look up to. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, sometimes that, that who they are in public doesn't match who they are in private. And that was one thing that I really noticed, unfortunately, coming into the league. Um, so, but again, you got to have that foundation of prayer as soon as you lose that, because they might have the best intentions in the world. I might have the best intentions. You never know. Look at Judas. He was performing miracles, and the next thing you know, he killed himself. And how, how sad is that, that at any moment, we can completely turn away from Jesus Christ but we all, we all have to be humble, and we always have to understand that everything is through the grace of God, and we have to be very appreciative of that. Um, but I, I hope that answers your question a little bit. That was a, somewhat of a, a, of a tangent, but that community is, is so important, and I, I've tried to nurture that. Dustin Colquitt, you know, a longtime punter for the Chiefs, he joined the church a couple years ago. Um, so that's a, a very beautiful relationship that, that we had, and now he's, he's Catholic and his five kids yeah, as well. That's great. So it's definitely some fruit. Uh, I think uh, I, I'd heard Father Richard Rocha, who's the Catholic chaplain of the Chiefs and an alum of Benedictine College, um, I think that he was telling me that he'll go and do the Saturday vig vigil, this vigil Mass on Saturday before games. Is that right, or how do you get your Mass in? Your yeah, Sunday yeah, mass? yeah, yeah, correct. Um, yeah, Saturday evening, he comes to the, the hotel, and there's an organization called Athletes for Christ that sets up a priest coming to the way yeah. uh, hotels as well. So at, le at least they can understand that as Catholics, you know, we got, we got to go to Mass. We have yeah. to honor the Sabbath as best as we can, right. and they'll have a priest come uh, for Mass. And then one thing that I started actually doing recently was, was having a, a priest uh, from what area we were going to that celebrated the, the extraordinary form, the traditional oh. Latin Mass, and he, they would come to the hotel room, and that's been a, a great way for me to kind of see all of the different uh, priests around the country that are, um, you know, fighting for uh, tradition and, and reverence in the Mass. You and your family has been drawn to the extraordinary form, the Latin Mass, uh, so tell us about that journey and how that came about. So when I, w when I first came to the Chiefs, I went to uh, like a five, six o'clock mass in the evening, and it was a, a low mass, I think. At that time, I didn't really know the difference. I was just finding a mass. Okay, it happens to be extraordinary form. And there were no servers there. And I just thought, wow, this is such a shame. You know, there aren't, I know there's boys in this parish, but no one's serving. So I had a, a priest friend of mine that I had actually met at Notre Dame Seminary when I was visiting Grant, uh, when he was in seminary, and he kind of helped point me towards a lot of resources and I, I learned how to celebrate, or not celebrate, to serve. And we got all these boys and we had probably 12 boys serving and then, and then COVID hit, unfortunately. Yeah. But just from serving is when I was able to see just the, the differences and see how much the boys love to serve because it was so much more challenging for them and they really, um, they loved it. And, you know, I'll always be grateful for that, for that time. But since then COVID hit and then our second child was born. So now, I'm in the pew with our three-year-old. My wife's with the, with the one-year-old normally <laughs> in the back. And that's kind of that's my, my role right now. It's just in the pews. And maybe one day when, when my oldest son is old enough, I'll help him out a little bit on the yeah. altar. Well, thank you for, for that. I can imagine these kids say, I get to serve with a Kansas City Chiefs football player. <laughs> right, right. You know, that doesn't happen every day. So thank you yeah. for, for that. Um, for that. Um, so tell me about... Um, so you're not doing this alone, right? Uh, tell us about your history, the relationship with your wife, Isabel, how long you dated. I think you're a high school sweethearts, right? Yeah. And so tell us about that. Yeah, so Isabel and I actually started talking when I was in middle school. Um, I know. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. But so you didn't I, become official till yeah, when. I I, I'm, I'm learning the language. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> talking and... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, in middle school, the soccer team was like a, I'm pretty sure it was seventh and eighth grade soccer was together. So my, my sister was in eighth grade. Isabel was in seventh grade. I'm in sixth grade. And I'm just going to, you know, my, my sister's soccer games and Izzy, I call her Izzy. She, she was there. And so we, we kind of started talking. We were just hanging out at a lot of events together. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I remember I was, yeah, you gave me a shout out for my tuba playing. So as a tuba player, I'm in the back row and right behind tuba players, the drum, the percussionist, and she was a percussionist. And I remember, <laughs> I remember saying some like slick joke to her and she immediately shut me down. And so that was when I realized, okay, we can kind of be friends, but if I try to take this anywhere else, I'm just gonna get uh, completely shut down. So then in, in high school, fast forward, I'm in ninth grade, she's in 10th grade. Um, I guess I was a little bit more persistent, but we actually started dating at, uh, at that young of an age. So yeah, I was in ninth grade, 10th grade, dated all the way up until sophomore year of college. So that's, you know, what, four or five, six years. Six years down the line, we had been dating and I had this big conversion. I had completely changed kind of who I was. I was leave, living a completely different life. And, you know, she was a, a believer. I don't know if she prayed a ton, but, you know, she couldn't get on board with with who I had become, you know, she, she liked the old Harrison. So we actually broke up then. And I, I just decided, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm Catholic, if I'm living this new life on the straight and narrow, you know, I need to make sure I find someone, you know, that, that kind of understands where I'm at and is gonna provide a strong community for me and not pull me away. So we broke up. I told her, you know, Isabel, I'm gonna pray a rosary for you every day. And, uh, you know, I love you very much, but, you know, it's obviously just, like, not going to work. And she was completely fine with that. She was ready to move on. But she called me maybe six, seven months down the road and out of nowhere said, you know, I think I want to become Catholic. And we hadn't been talking at all in that period or very little. And it just came out of the blue. And she said, you know, I've started to pray the rosary. And I just, wow. I really want to become Catholic. And after talking more, you know, it was just, she was, she'd went through a lot of tough things in college as I talked about the lows of college and all the stress and anxiety and stuff that goes on there and was very lost. And I think through praying the rosary and having that meditation time, um, she was able to, to maybe get some answers through prayer, but she felt very uh, comforted by Our Lady at that time. And so she became Catholic and I was very happy for her, obviously, but I'd kind of moved on. I'd, I wasn't dating anybody else, but I had no intentions of us getting married or, or dating again. I mean, I had changed a lot, she had changed a lot, but it was funny. I mean, the way God works, we were able to just fall back in love again and um, dated for maybe another year or so and then got engaged and, and got married. But, you know, we are high school sweethearts, but we are two completely different people. You know, and we were very similar, went way, way away from each other and then back and um, it's just a, a beautiful way that the Holy Spirit can work. And now, you know, we're, we're very strong and uh, we have two beautiful children. And I, um, you know, I would just urge everyone to try to get in your vocation as soon as possible. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And like, why do we have a vocation? A vocation is actually to help us get to heaven, you know? So I would urge everyone, everyone here to, to take a hold of that and, and really be courageous, be bold in, in starting your life, um, whether that's, you know, in a family or becoming a priest or a nun wherever that takes you. But um, that's just been a, a very beautiful thing for me to, to have not delayed marriage and starting a family. And I, I couldn't ask for anything better. I'm just, I'm so grateful to be in this position, but it was, it was me and her having to say yes to, uh, to, to something that, you know, really isn't encouraged a lot. I'm sure here you see it a lot and that's how important uh, mentors are and people to look up to. But, you know, at, at Georgia Tech, <laughs> It was a secular college. It wasn't until I went to the Catholic Center and saw people that were in the world normal, but they loved Jesus, they loved the sacraments. And that was the first time I, I could actually see that and see how beautiful um, it was. And that encouraged me to be countercultural and to be strengthened by that community. Wow, that's a, that's a great story. Uh, I wanna go back to how the playing the tuba now uh, I, I you found your spouse through the tuba but but you also told me a story about uh, how you became a kicker through the tuba too so tell us about that story yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, when I was a, a freshman the senior tuba player was the starting kicker and he had come to some soccer games and said you know you got a you got a big leg you should try out to be the field goal kicker and I didn't really care about football, but at the same time, I went to a pretty small high school and all my friends were on the football team. So I went out, I tried out and I was, I was decent and I could finally join the team, but it was actually my mom that was like, did not want me to join at all. She was not a football fan, didn't want me to get any concussions, even though it's a kicker, you're probably not gonna get any. So it was, <laughs> it was actually at a, a soccer game, she was uh, talking about this 
probably disparagingly about, about football with some other soccer uh, moms. And the kicking coach, the special teams coordinator, was actually in the, in the booth, and he came down and was like, oh, are you talking about Harrison Butker? You know, he's going to be our next kicker. Like, you need to <laughs> allow him to, to kick and play football. So I can thank Jeff Oser, that senior tuba player, for, for getting me to try out <laughs> and start my career. And... Um, yeah, I would have never thought I'd, I'd be a football player. I didn't really grow up a football fan, and now I'm, and now I'm here uh, thanks to the tuba. I love, I love that. So, um, so through the tuba, you found your wife, and now you're an NFL kicker. So I'm assuming the tuba players in the Raven Regiment are standing a little taller tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <So>, <laughs> I'm going to get a uh, – Coach Osborne's going to go out of two players knocking on his door right, to right, right, uh, right. be Try kickers out, right yes. now, I'm sure. Um, okay, so uh, how do you um, – so clearly faith, faith is really important to you. How do you relate to your fellow players who have a less, less of a foundation in their religion? Or do you – or how does that work in the, in the locker room? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good question. I think it starts with – your witness and the way you go about your everyday life. You know, even if we're not Catholics, we can still grow in the natural virtues, you know, fortitude, temperance, um, justice, and I'm missing one more. Uh, fortitude, come on, philosophy major. Fortitude, temperance, prudence, justice, there we go. But you can grow in all these virtues without even knowing who Jesus Christ is. So you can be a virtuous person, which I think in this world is still something that, that stands out. So you can be a virtuous person, and obviously through um, your relationship with Jesus, through the grace of the sacraments, you grow in faith, hope, and charity. But, you know, I talked about this earlier. Coach Reed doesn't really want us talking a lot about, you know, religion or politics, which I completely understand as a football team. You want everybody together and fighting for each other. But I think when you do start that friendship when you've been a witness to people and they kind of see how you are then they probably want to get to know a little bit more about you know what gets you up in the morning what what makes you the way you are and then that's when you share the faith with them and talk about your story your testimony whatever it is that that uh makes you on fire for the faith but i think that's where you can um really have a great impact in people and you never know who it's going to impact. I remember when, when Grant and I were, were on fire for the faith. We're going around just trying to evangelize the whole locker room. There's a bunch of fallen away Catholics that were trying to get to come back to the faith. And then it was just random guys that we weren't even investing a lot of time in. You know, we weren't inviting them to the, the Bible studies, the different hangout things. They were the ones, kind of like Isabel, who out of nowhere just said, you know, I've just, I want to become Catholic or I want to know more about the rosary. So... To, to me, it's about the witness that we said, and it's the Holy Spirit that works. No matter if we have the perfect arguments, you know, if we know everything, at the end of the day, the Jews that, that killed Jesus, they, they knew that the, the Messiah was going to be killed. They knew all of these things. They, they knew that Jesus was the Messiah, a lot of them, and they still rejected him. So just because we can know something doesn't mean that our heart can truly be uh, converted to it. And that's where, you know, that's really just the grace of God. And we always have to be thankful for that or else we're going to lose it like Judas did. And um, that really motivates me to, to stay grounded because just at an instant, you know, we can, we can completely become a, a different person, unfortunately, and not be working towards a, a just goal and towards the kingdom. Yeah. So... Um Sometimes we get in this, um, we think, oh gosh, the only way we can serve the church is if we do mission work or if we become a priest or a religious. But you've taken the talents that God gave you uh, and you're serving the church and you're, and you're a witness. So tell us, give, give us some advice to our students here about taking their talents and, and uh, doing them for the greater glory. Yeah, um, I think, you know, charitable work is a, is a great place to start. Um, you know, Jesus, he's the, the son of God. He is God, and yet he's washing his disciples' feet. And he said, if you want to be great, basically, you, you have to serve, and you have to be a servant. So we need to be servants. And then also he said that if we, any good deed that we do to someone that's lesser than of us, that lesser than us is like us doing it to him. So that 
is great motivation for us to go out and serve those that are less fortunate than us because then we're serving Jesus and that's a meritorious act that can help us grow in, in uh, where we are in, in, in heaven. Um, but we have to be active and that's, you know, I don't, we all have different temperaments. We all have different personalities. You know, some people like, like Grant, I think naturally just can go out of their way and just talk with people and be outgoing. That's something I really struggle with. But again, because I kick these footballs through uprights, you know, I've been given this platform and I can go out and I can, I can, I can at least share the gospel message and share the good news about the faith and the sacraments. Um, and then also I can affect change in the community with, with charitable work because, you know, that's what, that's what Jesus tells us to do. And if you get anything from today, you know, please pray for God's will and uh, um, follow Jesus' example uh, to the best of your ability. And that's what's going to bring the most happiness uh, to our life and eventually eternal happiness in heaven. That's, that's beautiful. My wife reminds me that I'm, I'm supposed to say let his will be done, not Steve's will be done. Right, That's right. My, my problem. Okay. Um, now, we've talked about faith and family. I want to talk a little bit about football, too. Okay. Uh, so you don't become an NFL kicker by going to church and hanging out with your family all the right, time, right, right? Right, right? So tell us what you do to prepare yourself to be at the highest levels. Yeah. So um, as an industrial engineer, I think I, I take that kind of analytics background to everything I do with kicking. Mm -hmm. Probably super boring, but I get very, I guess, scientific with everything I do, and I just look at it as like probabilities. Like if I, we were talking about this earlier, if I close my left eye and point my right arm, I'm probably going to aim a little bit better than the kicker that doesn't do that, and that's going to hopefully increase the probabilities of me making this kick. Me sitting on the sideline when the defense is out on the field and praying is going to allow me to be able to focus even more when I need to when the offense gets the ball and I have to go out there and kick. You know, me analyzing the smallest details of my technique in film is going to give me an advantage. But then also me going to Mass as often as I can during the week, me praying the rosary, that's all going to help me as well because, again, I need to be doing God's will, and I think God is going to help me if I'm on that path, and I don't ever want to leave that path. So, you know, we talk about faith family and football the faith has to be there the sacraments the prayer life if i'm not being a good husband and father i'm not going to be a good kicker hmm. i've i've really learned that um you know up close in that 2020 season i talk about that a lot just i mean I, i'm very blessed that the most struggle i had was just those extra points if y'all chiefs fans know a little bit um <laughs> If faith's not there, if the family's not there, how can I expect the least important thing in God's eyes to be in line? So that was a good wake-up call for me uh, to kind of get my life in order. And mm -hmm. I always say less is more, but it, it's, it's less in the sense of the world that you need to get no sleep and just be working 24-7. Well, I'm going to work less, I'm going to sleep more. So you might be saying I'm doing less, but because I'm doing that, I'm able to do more with the faith, more with my family, and then it makes the whole football, whatever occupation, whatever your vocation is, um, way easier. So, um, yeah, it's been, been very important for me to keep that faith family football uh, in line. And, I, again, I'm, I'm blessed to do something for a living that I absolutely love. You know, I, I, I've fallen in love with, with kicking a football, as weird as that sounds. But as soon as I don't like doing that anymore... You know, why would I be kicking? Am I just kicking now for money? Am I kicking now for accolades? Well, if I'm just doing that for myself, I'm probably not being the father and the husband that I should be, right? So I never want to get to the point where I'm needed the house for whatever reason. The kids are in high school. Or there's something going on important. And the only reason I'm playing football is because I'm chasing a certain accolade or I'm chasing this and that, all of these different worldly things. But right. if I'm praying for God's will, maybe he'll just have me miss the field goals and that'll be an easy decision for me. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have a choice, I'm, I'm done playing. Um, yeah, so faith, family, football, it's so important. I, I can't ever forget that. One of our students uh, asked, uh, what's going through your mind when you line up for a game-winning field goal, a 49-yard field goal against the Bills? Um, so walk us through that. Uh, I, you said something I thought was kind of interesting. I don't know if you ever see uh, Harrison before a field goal. He, he, his arm actually literally goes like this. I didn't know you closed one eye. Right, right. But so walk, walk us through that and kind of what's going through your mind. Yeah. Um, so, again, being a robot, you know, I, I mean, I can get up, but, you know, I start. Oh, definitely. We got to have yeah. to get up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I start with 
my foot the exact same width next to the ball, the exact same length behind the ball. I take my steps three uh, steps back, and I know exactly how long those steps are. It's 92 inches, and I practice that every single time I kick. My step's over, 78 inches. I know exactly what that is. I can go on the hash during the game, if you've ever been to a game, and I'm doing those same steps on the hash because I know based on the hash what 78 inches is. And then I get here, I know exactly where I'm pointing my toe. I know where this right foot needs to be. I know all my different cues for my upper body. I know where I want to uh, approach the ball. There's all these things because if my plant foot is, is that far forward or back, left or right, that's gonna affect a ton of stuff with my hips, my foot, and that's the difference between us losing to the Bengals versus us not even playing the Bengals. Yeah, right. right. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, at least I got this guy right yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> but it, it's all very important, and you got some kickers that are just field kickers, but I think just putting in that extra effort has helped me a little bit more. Um, and yeah, again, I, I love, I love doing it, and um, it's a blessing. But yeah, if 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 you have eight hours every single day just to get better at you know one task, you're going to get really <laughs> minute with yeah. uh, with everything that you're doing. Uh, so when you approach oh, the yeah. ball, you do this before you take your steps back and over? Yeah, so oh, okay. it was in, in college. I was just missing a lot of short field goals. And finally, I think, you know, the special teams coach pulled up some film. It was like, man, Harrison, you were like aiming, you know, at the right, right upright, you know, where were you aiming? I'm like, I thought I was aiming middle. But for whatever reason, I, I just struggled with that. And I, I realized, you know, we have a dominant eye. Well, if I close my left one, that'll make it a lot easier. And I just use my right hand to line up my right foot toe with the spot of the ball with the middle of the upright. So I know that's exactly where I'm aiming. But I don't know if anyone golfs, but that's kind of similar. You know, you, you look at your target line, you come to the right, and your feet are normally parallel to the line you want to swing on. And yeah, you can just get better and better the, the, the more you work at it. But um, it's been something that's helped me. I know it looks goofy and funny out there, but <laughs> no, that's yeah, a, it, it that's works. pretty amazing. Now that yeah. you see him, now you'll understand why. This is our in industrial engineer kicker, right. I guess, right? Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, we asked him if he opens both eyes when he approaches the ball, and he's thinking about becoming a pirate and just putting a patch yeah, over yeah. there. Only one eye. No, yeah. I don't think so. Um, all right, so. Um, Tell us about your mindset, and I think I probably anticipate the answer, yeah. but is there a different mindset of a 49-yard game, game-winning field goal or a, an extra point? Right, right. So going back to that 2020 season and uh, the extra points, I think I really, besides I think the, the faith in the family not being where it needed to be, not being as strong and intact as it should be, I think not having the fans in the stadium was making me just too relaxed out there. And I, I didn't give each kick enough credit and enough respect. It was, it was probably a pride of, you know, 33 yarder and, you know, there's no fans. You almost forget that it's game, a game. It feels almost like a scrimmage. Um, so that was another good learning point for me to take into kind of the second half of 2020. I, I figured it out. But then in the 2021 season as well, just treating every kick like it is a game winner. So you kick the 33 yard extra point at the very start of the game. That kick mentally should be the same kick as the 49 yarder in overtime. And I think I did have started to do a better job in practice of every kick is an important kick. Every kick is a game winner. And every kick's probably like a long, like a 60 yard game winner. If I treat every kick like that, then the 49 yard overtime kick, you know, isn't that big of a deal. And I kind of take that with every area of my life almost is at least when I'm kind of going over a certain event I might be doing or some uh, conversation I'm going to have, I kind of try to rehearse it a little bit and maybe put a little bit more pressure on myself than I should, make it a little bit more difficult so that when I get there, I can just let kind of God work and I'm not stressed out about it. And it almost seems a lot easier than I would have expected it to be when I was kind of rehearsing it in, mm -hmm. my, in my head. So when it's practice, I try to put as much stress as I can on the kick. And then when it gets to a big kick, that's when I'm praying the rosary. I'm relaxed, my heart rate's down and God's will is gonna be done. Huh. You know, oh, hopefully that's great. In. Well, uh, tell me, um, and this is maybe a nerd question, but I think I believe that on extra points, you can put the ball anywhere you want on the field, right? Right, right. Yeah. But you put yours on the, I think, the far left hash mark, is yes, that right? Yes, yes. And tell us why you do that. Um, so a lot of people probably don't realize this, but if you're kicking on the hash, 
a lot of times, well, I make Tommy do this a lot of times, but he'll put the ball on the corner of the hash. So now I can actually stare at a spot the entire time I'm going versus if you're in the middle of the field, you're staring at a big piece of green and then the finger comes up and you don't know what you're looking at and then boom, the ball goes down. So at least having the hash, I can stare at the spot the whole time and then the ball's down. And then a lot of times my ball had a left draw on it and I just felt if I'm on the left hash, I can just kind of aim a little right. If it goes straight, it's in. And then if it hooks, that's the best chance of it, of it mm -hmm. staying in. Yeah. So that was kind of my thinking. Here's another weird uh, uh, nerdy question. A lot do of you, kicking questions. Do, yeah. you, do you and the uh, uh, holder talk? Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, so he's basically my caddy. And a lot of we talked about the laces a little bit, right? Uh -huh. So right. <laughs> do you all want to hear all these yeah. kicking? Stuff? Oh, my goodness. I forget maybe, how many. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm here. the only one that wants to hear yeah. this. right? Is the, is the kicker for Benedictine here? He's probably loving this. He's not here. OK. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, a, a, a soccer ball doesn't have any laces, right? It's uniform. The, the weight is equally distributed. But if you take a football, well, now the weight's going to be unevenly distributed, and there's going to be more weight wherever the laces are. So if I'm in a vacuum and I'm kicking the ball right down this line, but the laces are facing over there, and I, I'm a robot and I kick it completely straight, well, that ball is actually going to veer right because of the weight of the laces over there. So. That's why you want the laces facing exactly where, where you're going to kick the ball. So just communication-wise, with my holder, again, we have eight hours a day to go over all this stuff. So I'm sure you don't have that much time. you got to study for something. But I want the laces facing exactly where I'm kicking. So I'll tell Tommy, or normally we talk about it before we go on the field. Um, you know, I, I actually, we split the uprights into four quadrants. If, if we're aiming middle, I say zero. If we're aiming the right upright, I say plus four. Left, upright, negative four. So obviously, right middle would be plus two. Between right middle and right upright, plus three. Like, all right, I'm sure you all get it. But I'll go to the holder, uh, Tommy, and we'll, I'll say, okay, plus three. And then if I feel like, for whatever reason, my ball is tailing left that day, then he'll lean it a little bit more towards him. Or if I feel like I'm slicing it, he'll lean it more uh, straight up and down. So we talk not only about where we're facing the laces, but then the lean, and then if it's really windy, wind in the face, I actually want to tilt the ball forward so it comes off at a lower trajectory. Because if you're hitting an object in, into wind, the object's just going to rise up. So if I hit a normal ball into wind in my face, that ball's just going to go straight up in the air and probably drop short. So I actually want it to come out a little bit lower, lower, and then the wind will raise it up and it'll kind of be a normal trajectory kick. But the holder, you know, is a is a big reason for for success or or failure. And you know, Tommy's done done great for me. Wow. So, okay. That's yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So here at Benedictine, our, our vision is to transform culture in America. Okay. And so um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I know you have thoughts on the culture and, and the impact it has on young people. You're worried about it with your kids and things like that. What can, do you have any advice you can give our students here about how important that is to have this mindset of transforming the culture? Um, I, think, I think it's very important that we are centered on Christ, that we care about his opinion over the world's opinion, over our coworkers' opinion, over social media's opinion. We should really only care about Christ's opinion. That comes from a deep prayer life. We have to have a relationship. If, if you have a distant grandmother and you never talk to her, you don't know what she thinks, you don't know who she is, right? So with Jesus, we, we have to continually um, be talking with him, and it might be a, a one-way conversation, but you know, through prayer, I think we can definitely receive a, a lot of graces and be pointed in the right direction there. So we got to be centered on Christ, and he's going to show us the way. But, you know, we, we can only be saints in whatever time we're born in. And this is the time we're born in. I don't know if it's better or worse than the time of any of these other great saints that we look up to. But God has called us to be saints in this environment. And I think social media is an area where, um, you know, it can be a toxic environment. I think for for people that are uh, that are voicing their opinions, and then they see all this uh, pushback, maybe in the comments, the messages. I don't know how that looks, but as you can imagine, I I receive a lot of stuff. Is if I say anything that I believe in, you know, I get a lot of uh, messages, uh, dissenting voices, but. Just because someone's got a, a microphone doesn't mean that they're the majority. And a lot of times, 
someone can be saying something, you need to be quiet, you're crazy, and you can want to believe that. That's just our, our nature, that we want to be liked and we want to be loved by those around us, but we have to be centered on Christ and, and that strong community. So I've had a, an opportunity to have a lot of uh, really great uh, mentors that I've been able to grow closer with uh, the past um, couple of seasons. Um, Senator Josh Hawley was, was someone that I've been able to, yeah, someone I've been able to talk to and He's been a great mentor for, for mine as someone that is, you know, saying what a lot of us believe, but he's getting a lot of, of, of pushback. But he, he does it in a virtuous and loving way. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to become Catholic one day. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but he always says, he says, uh, you know, uh, Judge Jackson, you know, I, I have nothing wrong with your character, with, with who you are as a person. I, I have great conversations with you, but what you believe is fundamentally wrong, and, and here's why. And, we should be able to disagree with people but love them, right. right? Like, just because we have a disagreement doesn't mean we should just smile and not even address it and life goes on. Well, if we love this person, we should explain what we have an issue with and not be afraid of that conversation. I think so often, you know, people, they smile, nice to meet you, we're, we're good friends, then behind closed doors, that's when they're talking poorly of that person. Instead of just saying it to their face uh, of what they believe, but doing it in a loving and charitable way. Uh, I think that's a, a great point that, that thankfully through, you know, mentors like uh, Senator Hawley, I've, I've been able to, uh, to, to grow in. And then um, Austin Quick, he's a, he's, a, he's a great friend of mine um, that I'm sure the people in this room, room know. He's, he's done a, a great job in pushing me to get out of my comfort zone, to get out of the house, to, to use my platform. Um, and again, that comes back to community of... Um, you know, pushing beyond what's comfortable, doing things that are great, which so often in our society of comfort we don't want to do, um, and going out there and having real conversations, tough conversations, and, and making an impact and being saints in our day and age. So, um, yeah, it's been a lot of great mentors. Um, uh, Cardinal Burke is someone that I've, uh, you know, we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, he was able to come to our, our house and, and meet the kids, and we were able to uh, build a chapel and make that the foundation of our family life of, of prayer, and he was able to come and bless our chapel. But someone like Cardinal Burke, who's, I think, just gotten pushed around a lot, he's probably the holiest person I've ever met mm -hmm. in my life. And going back to you know college time, when I was growing up in high school and then got to college, I thought for you to be a holy Christian person, you had to have no personality, never smiled, never laughed. You needed to be this perfect robot. And I didn't see good mentors. I didn't have great community until I saw the Catholic Center there. And then from there, you know, I talked about Senator Hawley, but um, Cardinal Burke, seeing just a holy man with a sense of humor and, you know, a way, to, a way about him that is just, um, you know, just just makes you want to be a saint as well. So that he's, that's been a, an amazing uh, relationship there. But um, I just again, magnanimity, doing things that are great, going out of our comfort zone to be saints and growing in virtues and, and being leaders wherever that that takes you. Yeah, that's amazing. When we're here, uh, we talk to our students a lot of times about Pope Benedict's uh, quote. He says, "The world promises you comfort, yeah. but you're not made for comfort. You're made for greatness." Right. And so you're getting out of the comfort zone and doing great things. I appreciate that message to our our young people. Um, we're going to have to stop our conversation now because uh, uh, the first practice, the off-season practice, is actually tomorrow. We need to get him home and get his 10 to 12 hour sleep, right? You know, uh, they're going to make fun of me. Yeah, right no. Now, yeah. But uh, well, I mean, uh, he said he started turning it around with faith and then sleeping more and getting better diet. And so I appreciate uh, appreciate that message to our kids as they're getting ready for finals, right? You know, uh, getting that sleep. Father Ryan helped a lot in, in this uh, day, as did Shane Vaughn and Dean Wirtz and Diane Holly. I um, appreciate uh, Harrison. I mentioned Austin Quick being here. And, but your inspiration has been really fantastic for our young people, and I appreciate uh, who you are as a person. And faith, family, and football in that order is uh, very inspiring to us and me especially. Well, yeah, th thank you for having me. This is uh, yeah. a blessing for me. I, I've heard so many great things about Benedictine College. I'm glad to be here. Uh, please pray for me. The more prayers, the better. Um, Football-wise, I have a lot of people to say, you know, we've just been praying for you. So I, I firmly believe, you know, that these prayers are, are uh, helping God's will to be done. But, you know, um, if you have any mentors, people in the world that you look up to, please pray for them because they need that, you know. And it can be a, a, a lonely time maybe 
having to be that leader, be at the top. Um, but yeah, just, just please pray for me and, and anyone else that, that you look up to and think are doing great things in, in the world. I'm not embarrassed to say that Amy and I got our rosaries out and held them while you lined up for that 49 year, uh, yard field it goal. It okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We have a gift for you here. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wow. All right. You got your own number seven nice. Raven jersey, huh? Nice. Great, great. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. uh, great. Yeah. Good. Let's hear it for Harrison Butker. Thank you. Yeah, this sure. is great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thank buddy. You. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Thank you. Okay.